to welcome Brian Grady, who will be telling us about some stuff from algebraic K theory. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, and uh, <clears throat> apologies for not exactly matching my title, which I think was persistence over the circle, but the circle will make an appearance. So um, yeah, so today I wanna to talk about uh, algebraic K theory of persistence modules, and this is kind of ongoing work with Anna Shenfish, who's um, somewhere in the audience, the virtual audience. So great. So yeah, so right, I wanna talk about algebraic K theory of persistence modules and I'll, I'll make some definitions in a second. So, but a few things, um, what's the rough idea? So I'll have a category with sums. And so here you might sort of think, um, you know, sets, um, if you want, could be topological spaces. You know, typical things we think of are like uh, R modules or vector spaces, um, A with direct sum, right? And these will be the, the things our persistence modules take values in. Um, so this morning we saw some examples and well, we could have thought of that uh, persistence modules um, as being sequences of spaces, or we could have applied homology and thought of maybe with field coefficients and thought of them as vector spaces, right? And then I'm gonna have some space of parameters, right? Which is where the persistence theory comes in. And for me, this will be, um, uh, so there's different things you could have here. So P could just be a post set, um, partially ordered set, or I could think of, um, maybe what I'll really be interested in is I have a stratified space. So I have a topological space and it comes equipped with a map to a post set. So this would be a stratified space. And I'll do a few examples in a second. Okay. And so for me, what's kind of my working definition of a persistence module, it's just a V valued assignment um, parameterized by P. Right, so it's like a sequence of vector spaces or a sequence of topological spaces or R modules, whatever you like, okay? All right, well, let's make that slightly more precise. And for today, um, I'll, I'll use this ansatz that persistence modules are constructible Cauchy's on a parameter space. And so this parameter space here, I, again, I'm thinking of this, um, my parameter space would be like X, to P, a stratified space, okay? And this way of thinking about um, persistence modules uh, has been around for a little bit. So people like Curry and Patel, Peter a little bit, um, Kashivar and Shapira, others uh, in sort of the French sphere sort of take this as, a, as one possible definition of a persistence module, okay? So <clears throat> where do these, um, where, where do we get examples from? So one type of example um, comes from the same thing we saw this morning where we have a, say like a Morse function, right? And so we think of having the real line and then I can just stratify that with the, by the critical values um, of this function. So uh, here I just think about, um, the real line, and now I add these, I, I split it up into connected intervals, in, into little intervals and zero strata and the zero strata are like where stuff changes, right? So uh, at least this kind of preliminary example, this first example seems to fit into this picture. I'll note that this actually also works for higher Morse functions. So um, you can do things like a two Morse function. Uh, so that would be here, this would be like a stratification of R2. And there it's kind of interesting because you don't just have uh, zero and one dimensional strata, you have two dimensional, one dimensional and zero dimensional strata. So that's kind of a cool picture. Um, yeah, so we might, <clears throat> and I, I can do this on the next slide. We can think about having a filtration or even a, a, a zigzag type module. So a, a zigzag module is um, maybe where you have something like a post set uh, you know, something like this. So here's an example of like a 
depth one post set, something like this, or you could have the arrows going the other way as well. Um, and these also make an appearance in theory and they, they fit just as well into this, this framework. So things like zigzag modules, um, this also works in higher dimensions, but I'm just restricting to one dimension for today. And you might have other things like periodic data. Um, and, and there you might think of your parameter, maybe your space of parameters are periodic. And so you have the circle, or you could imagine having sort of multiple parameters and one of them's periodic and one of them's some um, length scale. And so you might have something like uh, your parameter space could be a cylinder and you could have an interesting stratification of a cylinder or something like that. Okay. Okay. So, uh, right. So what's the, what's the co-sheaf floating around? <clears throat> okay. Well, first, um, so a co-sheaf is like a dual notion to a sheaf. And so it's an assignment to opens and these opens are compatible with inclusions and the maps go the same way as inclusions. Whereas sheaves reversed uh, the direction of arrows, co-sheaves preserve that direction of arrows. And if you, um, I'll just uh, make another little reminder here. So oftentimes we think of um, sheaves, say, uh, as continuous functions, right? So continuous functions restrict to subsets. And so you get maps going that way. Whereas co-sheaves are kind of uh, a nice example of co-sheaves um, we can think of is compactly supported functions. Okay. So, <clears throat> and there's, there's ways to actually to make that essentially entirely, you know, precise in terms of well, every sheaf can be realized as, in fact, continuous sections of, of uh, a bundle over it, a space over it. But anyway, okay, so <clears throat> suppose we have some um, filtration, right? So, I, and this was the type of input that uh, showed up in the first talk of the day, right? And then maybe we were interested uh, in applying homology. Um, homology or maybe just H zero or whatever. And to get to get a persistence module persistence module. And well, I, I'm suggesting that, yeah, well, we should think about that as a co-sheaf on some stratified space. And here, the co-sheaf I have in mind uh, lives on R. And so I'll add in zero strata, um, and maybe I'll index these by the same, uh, suppose I have some finite filtration here. Um, and then I have this co-sheaf information. Um, <clears throat> and constructible here means it's locally constant on strata. And since all of my strata are, are connected here, um, it's just literally constant on strata, okay? And so, and, and basically, um, what I do is I just, uh, I just change things when I, I, I just do the, do the, the thing that you might expect. I, I just make changes when I pass through a zero stratum. And so here, um, I might think of this as something like, well, to this, to this little, either one of these open intervals or half closed intervals, uh, I'm, I'm associating the homology of say K1 in this instance, okay? And so this actually, this, this co-sheaf is not so interesting. It just tells you kind of how to fit um, filtered spaces and their homology into this picture, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> uh, what we've been talking about to, to this point is, one half of an interesting equivalence. So we've been talking about co-sheaves, which are constructible on a stratified space. And it turns out that there is a relationship between these things. In fact, there's a equivalence between such co-sheaves and functors out of the so-called entrance path category of the stratified space into our target category V, okay? And there are various hypotheses you need on the stratified space. 
but let's just assume those are uh, satisfied. Okay, and and this is um, this is this equivalence is proven in different domains um, by Jacob Lurie, Clark Barwick, Curry and Patel, David Truman, and certainly goes back to at least ideas of McPherson. Um, so <clears throat> um, we're going to consider this category of functors, and this category of functors will on the on the right here will really be what we deal with. Okay. And what are these entrance paths? Well, so here I've drawn a picture below, I've drawn a picture of uh, R2, right? And I've stratified it. So um, I have these, these open strata, these uh, like here's, here's, here is one open strata. No, well, not really that guy, um, the whole thing. Here, like highlight it. Here's one stratum, here's another two stratum, here's another two stratum, right? And so they're all connected in this picture. And I have one zero strat one stratum of dimension zero and three strata of dimension one. Okay. And so an a path is just a path in the space that either stays within entirely within a stratum or goes down in dimension. Okay. So these purple paths are examples of entrance paths, whereas this blue path is not an example of an entrance path. It's actually the opposite. It's an example of an exit path. Okay. <clears throat> and so, um, right. So what we're really interested in is understanding this category of functors. And this will be our, um, so these, this is what I will take as sort of our, uh, our category of persistence modules uh, valued in V parameterized by X. Okay. So um, why, why did I want to do that? Uh, besides just sort of highlighting some nice mathematics? <clears throat> well, I'd like to compute the algebraic K theory of this. And the algebraic K theory is, um, it's an invariant. Uh, you know, it's, it's an invariant of categories um, and it extends the invariant of rings, for instance. And what you get out of it is something like a, cohomo a cohomology type object. So it's, it's something like a cohomology theory. So you actually can extract from it a, a spectrum. So roughly think of a cohomology theory or you can think of a space. Um, and from either of these first two objects, spectrum or, or space, you can extract groups. And how do you, how do you go from one to the other? you just up, take homotopy. So you take the homotopy groups, okay? And <clears throat> the way that you construct this thing depends very much actually on what your target category V is. So uh, red feels a little aggressive, let me switch. So a, an easy example is things where V is something like R mod, right? Um, so for instance, if R is actually a field, this is just vector spaces over K, right? <clears throat> and this is a so-called exact category. And there's a nice theorem, there's a, there's a nice theory due to Quillen. So here we can take say Quillen's uh, Q construction. Okay. And so because we have uh, things like we, we know what exact sequences are and this type of stuff in vector spaces and R modules in general, we, we can use Quillen's construction. Okay. So now suppose that we're um, interested in things that don't necessarily have like a great notion of exactness, right? Well, one nice situation we might be in is where we're in the category of sets. Um, and I'll put an I here to sort of just restrict to functions between sets which are injective, okay? Um, so this doesn't have a nice notion of, uh, it's not an exact category in general. Um, so, but what you can do is you can use this very combinatorial presentation of K theory. Um, you can use the theory of assemblers. And this is, uh, this the K theory of assemblers is due to Ina Zakharevich. Okay, <clears throat> and um, 
basically the the, the kind of moral and the, these are floating around various places that there's comparison theorems and no matter how you um, extract K theory, you get equivalent things at the end of the day and in particular you get isomorphic K groups. So, you know, if I choose to build a K theory spectrum one way and you choose to do a, build a K theory spectrum the other way, we're gonna get isomorphic K groups, okay? And I'll just point out that one reason why you might be interested in K-theory is, well, it's a little coarse. Um, it's pretty floppy, right? So you lose a lot of information, but it has this really nice property that it's the universal um, additive, inver the additive invariant. So it's like an in initial Euler characteristic. So um, in particular, so suppose C was a category and it had coproducts, right? And A was just some arbitrary abelian group. Okay. Well, then um, if I had something like an Euler characteristics, that'd be a map of groups from objects of C, or let's say a map of monoids from objects of C with respect to coproduct to my abelian group, that's going to factor uniquely through K theory. Okay. So it's like the initial Euler characteristic. So, it, and so that's a really nice property. Okay. Great. So <clears throat> um, the things I'm most interested in are these modules valued in VECT or these modules valued in SET. So what do you get at the end of the day? So suppose that we our parameter space is a stratified one manifold. OK. Um, well, this has a very nice presentation then. So this K-theory spectrum, so here I'm thinking of this as a spectrum. And again, if you don't like spectra, you can just think of, just think of it as like a space, okay? <clears throat> or some type of cohomology type object, right? Well, the K-theory spectrum of these persistence modules on this stratified one manifold actually split up as a giant wedge and they split up of a wedge of uh, sphere spectrum. So this is the sphere spectrum. Okay. and what do you what do you get? You get one summand uh, for each. Uh, all right, let's say x zero sitting inside of x. So each zero stratum I get a summand, and each one stratum I get a summand. Okay, so I have this, and these wedges are like the the analog of direct sum in the category of spectra. And so what I just have is this giant additive thing here. Okay. <clears throat> and that you get the sphere spectrum is actually kind of an interesting result. And this goes back to uh, Barrett and Pretty, uh, Quillen, and Siegel. Actually, they're not together. Okay. And so that, that's actually kind of a cool thing. So what happens if instead we are interested, say, in vector spaces? So we have uh, our persistence modules on our one manifold take values in vector spaces. Well, then what we get is we get the uh, algebraic K-theory of C. So, uh, and actually I wanted double things. So this is the algebraic K-theory of C. And the algebraic K-theory of even fields is, is a pretty interesting object. Um, and, and algebraic K theory of rings in general is, 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 has a lot of interesting structure. It turns out it's related to a lot of number theoretic questions, um, but this is a really rich object. And again, you have this additivity result. So it splits up as basically a sum over zero strata and a sum over one strata. Okay, so this is a purely one dimensional phenomena. Um, but what the corollary is, is so if we're just interested in uh, the K groups. So we just want to extract some abelian groups at the end of the day. Uh, if we, so if we just apply pi naught to this spectrum, or if we just say, what is the K, what's, what are the, what's the K theory group? We just get a bunch of copies of the integers here. And again, the sum is indexed by the same thing. Okay. And so what, what we're building is we're building this sort of universal additive invariant of our persistence modules in, this, in one dimension here. And we're seeing that it, it uh, 
even just at the in degree zero, it's giving us a copy of the integers for each of our zero strata and each of our one strata. And in some sense, this is not surprising. These Zs kind of, for vector spaces, they kind of um, relate to dimension. They're like counting the dimension of that vector space that lives over that stratum. But it turns out, especially if you're interested in the higher K groups, there's a huge number of interesting things. There's like copies of Q mod Z and funky stuff like this that appear in these uh, K theories. So that's where I wanted to stop today. So hopefully something I said was of interest. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Any um, questions for Ryan? Feel free to put him in the chat or just unmute yourself. I had a quick question. Um, so maybe this is uh, simplifying too much, but uh, I'm very interested in this representation of, you said persistence modules are these functors from NTX to say it's right, or, or to some uh, sufficiently complicated category. So if I if I want to get back to like the most basic, most canonical persistent homology, so that's F2 homology on topological spaces uh, in a reps complex say, so like indexed by the real numbers, what should I put in all those places? Is, is it is it obvious how you get that? Yeah, so, uh... Um, for, for sure. So basically, uh, what you get is you could realize that you have a post set um, like this, which describes your filtration. And so, um, <clears throat> and, and let's say that, you know, maybe I only have sort of finitely many, there, there's only finitely many times where my, uh, my complex is changing. Uh, and so this is this is the post that sort of index this indexes my filtration. And it turns out basically that this, so this is the post set. Um, and I can think of this post set as being equivalent uh, to the combinatorial entrance. So this little delta underneath, um, it, it's a extra thing. But in this case, it's it's uh, a particular um, stratification of R, <clears throat> and I just have um, I don't worry about sort of all say entrance paths and all strata, all points. I just sort of pick basically. I have a, a point for each strata, and then I, if they sit inside of each other, I um, I have an arrow, and so this category just looks like this post set. And so then what you're interested in is you're interested in maps from this post set to say uh, vector spaces over F2, right? And, and the data, so, it, and this, this particular functor, which I'll call say F, uh, F is determined by the complex, um, let's say, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe you have some sort of like rips complex or something like this, whatever. And so, um, or, or really, it's homology. So, so yeah, so you can exactly use that input data um, to, to build such a representation of this uh, entrance path category. And in this case, this, this entrance path category really does kind of decompose into the, the post set or, or maybe like double the post set of what you have in mind. And so it's just a, it's just like a fancied up version of the picture you have in your mind. So, but so the, the stratification of R may depend on the space I'm computing the reps complex of, right? Because you want to know it to stop. So I can't, there's no sort of fixed end category, end XP which is good for all VIPs complexes of all finite metric spaces. Is that right? Yeah, that um, that's right. Like in the in this 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 uh, so in this particular case that I have that we were discussing, I, I think of the stratification of R as being determined by the um, by the complex itself. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Well, Ryan, can I ask a question? Yeah. 
Yeah, nice talk, thanks. Uh, so, so I think I can kind of understand uh, or interpret maybe every, every, the stuff that you talked about in terms of what I know about persistence theory. And now what I don't think I can do is uh, interpret like higher K theoretic information, uh, which you maybe just barely or didn't quite get to at the end of the talk. Uh, could you kind of speculate as to what that might tell us? Um, yeah. Um, well, I, that's a great question. So like K, K not to me, like for instance, like in this one manifold case, like K not is just like basically a constructible integer valued function. And so that's, that's kind of like reading off various, like uh, some generalized Betty curve information. Um, and the, the higher K groups, I don't have a great interpretation of them yet. Um, I would like, I would like to find one. Um, yeah, I mean, as a, I, I come more from sort of like the geometric topological side and sort of there, I, I often think of higher topological K groups in terms of suspension or sort of, um, you, you know, these suspension isomorphisms. And that doesn't quite work in algebraic K theory as well. And so I don't have a great way to realize those classes. So if you had any thoughts about that, I'd be really interested. Thank, thanks. Uh, maybe I can ask another really hard question, <laughs> uh, sure. which is that you, uh, so in, in multiple angles and directions, uh, when you go from the kind of one dimensional case to the two dimensional case, uh, and this is something I, I promised to talk about in, my, in, in a couple of days, uh, th things get vastly harder and more interesting maybe. Uh, so I'm guessing that's also the case here. Uh, is, is that kind of true if you look at stratified sure. uh, manifolds coming? Yeah, so um, what's nice is that the setup is the same. Um, so for instance, you can still produce these K groups. The question of how to, like, how to compute them becomes more difficult. And so the, you still have additivity type theorems and you know that like algebraic K theory is still compatible with filtered co-limits. And so you have tools to compute them. It just doesn't break down into like this as nice of a direct sum decomposition. And so um, you have to be a bit more, you have to do a bit more work to identify say exactly what you get out at the end of the day. Um, but, but what is one nice aspect is that you can feed in whatever parameter space you want, right? And it doesn't, like the, the actual mathematics is kind of, um, uh, it doesn't really care about the dimension. Just it, you and I would like to sort of have, say groups at the end of the day that we can sort of have invariants live in and identifying those groups um, is more difficult in higher dimensions. Thanks.